Welcome to the Lucas Crowbot Show, where we uncover purpose, relentlessly pursue truth, and own the future. I'm your host, Lucas Crowbot, and I am so glad that you are here with me today. I'm I'm really excited about this next uh, couple of weeks, this next couple of episodes. We are launching into a little series on totalitarian cults. Now, um, you can have totalitarian states, you can have totalitarian um, groups, families, any sort of organization, um, but oftentimes cults and you know totalitarianism go hand in hand. And so I don't want to just talk about this in the, in the framework of you know the totalitarian state, the big bad state that's out to get you, even though everything that we're going to be talking about applies to that and really will be intersecting with that idea of totalitarian states or governments. Um, but specifically, I want to look at it in a, in a smaller microcosm because oftentimes I think I think in, in when I talk to other people, there's this idea of like, well, you know, that's that issue is far away. That issue is, you know, Yugoslavia back in the 90s. That issue is, you know, the French Revolution hundreds of years ago. Well, that that's happening in Venezuela. What what does that have to do with me today? Oh, well, that cultic, you know, group, that's them. You know, I'm fine over here in my world. But we don't realize that if we aren't aware of those totalitarian schemes and strategies that we can be susceptible, that we are susceptible to falling into those in our life. If we're not, if we're not aware of the schemes that could entrap us and destroy our life, we are going to fall into deception. And that we are we are approaching a day and a time across the earth where where deception is on the rise, where people are falling into um, great, great deception. And uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, yeah, just just a stupor of not thinking, not being aware. And, you know, the, the, the thing that totalitarian governments or cults or states hate the most, it's not critical thought. It's not a thought that is against them, but is thinking in general. And so much of us, so many people that I, I talk to, so much of what I hear and see across the world today, it is that. It is people just turning off their minds and not thinking. We have to be aware in this day and age. So today we're actually going to be revisiting a, a clip from Dr. Ignore. I don't know if you've listened to that episode uh, a few few shows back, a couple weeks back with Dr. Ignore where he talked and focused on free will. And I want to I want to pull up this clip of Dr. Ignore and we're going to talk about it a little bit as we go through it. We're going to break down some points and then at the end of it we'll we'll discuss it a little bit more of how this all relates to our lives, to where we are today. So here's a clip. A philosopher who I think has had the deepest insight into the consequences of denial of free will is Hannah Arendt. Uh, Hannah Arendt um, is a um, philosopher uh, in the 20th century. She originated the term the banality of evil, and she studied uh, Nazism and communism. Mm -hmm. and studied totalitarianism and she was a brilliant philosopher and she um described the basic nature of totalitarian government i think in a in, in a way that really gets to the heart of what it is and um it, it takes a moment to kind of go back and see how she looked at totalitarian governments and we can see how this relates to the to the denial of free will Arendt said that um there have only been a few basic styles of government that humanity has used over the past several thousand years. There's democracy, there's tyranny, there's dictatorship, there's a few basic ways of organizing people. Um, virtually all kinds of government before totalitarianism, which is a modern new way of doing it, virtually all kinds of government um, looked at stabilizing society by getting a set of laws so we all know the rules, we all play by the rules, we lead our lives in stable, controlled ways. Uh, even theocracies and so on um, have stable 
rules, whether they be rules of Islam or rules of Christianity or rules of Judaism. They're, they're all stable ways of doing things. He said that the totalitarian idea is radically different. Mm. What the totalitarian idea is, is that human society is organized not as a stable system of laws or rules, but as a movement, as a, essentially a tidal wave of change in nature. This is really important to hear this point that that totalitarian government states cults, they're not they're not out to set up structure and order and systems and a clear way of knowing, you know, where are the boundary lines. But it's set up in a way that is it is a movement. And if you look at the Soviet Union, when, you know, the USSR, when they were going through their whole Marxist revolution, it is this continual eating of their own. And so when they when they overthrew the the bourgeoisie months later, the very same revolutionary people who overthrew the ruling party were then overthrown and sent to the gulags and shot themselves. Why is this? Because totalitarian states, totalitarian cults are these movements. There's these these forces that's driving towards this quote unquote utopian world and and you see that in cults as well that there there are these well another point is the free will that he hit on this is really important and in this episode um the original episode with dr ignore he talked at length about how scientifically we have free will it's we're not social constructed you know we're not just a blob of meat who who's passing through this world but what cults and totalitarian ideologies want to do. They want to strip the individual away from thought, from agency, from their ability to have free will. And we're seeing this today with the critical race theory, intersectionality, where essentially you are just a construct of your upbringing, of your race, of your color, and your privilege can't be helped, be, and, and you can't help it. You are guilty because of your race or lack of race and they they even take away it's not guilt is no longer about something you do or don't do but it is about the group that you are a part of this is identity politics at its best and so why do they do that why do they strip everything away from actually our action our character the things that we choose to do because they want to take away your ability to think, your ability to act. And if they can take that away and they move it to you are just part of a group, then they can control you. And that's that is what the 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 ultimate goal of any sort of cult or any sort of totalitarian ideology is. And you don't have to live in a totalitarian state or be in a cult to be affected by some of these mindsets. But what's really important here to note is that we are individuals and we are not just socially constructed, that we have the ability to choose. It's not just baked into us. So let's continue this here. And the essence of totalitarianism is constant movement. We're always trying to, to reach the, the dictatorship of the proletariat or the domination of the Aryan race or whatever this, this movement is. And he felt that, or she felt, that this idea, this totalitarian idea that, that society wasn't a set of rules but instead was a, was, a, was, was a river raging, moving, really originated with Darwin, with the whole idea that we are evolving, that there's a natural selection out there, that there's this inherent um, evolution of human society built into nature, and that we really have no choice but to go with the flow. And she said that the totalitarian idea, and the, the, the for, for example, Marxists love Darwin, uh, Engels said really that basically what Darwin did for science, Marx did for history. Yeah. Uh, and they, so they identified themselves. The Nazis were very big on Darwinian yeah. evolution. So this is important here because if we think of Darwinian evolution, we think of these theories that have come out of Darwin that have then been – that Engels and Marx merged into Marxism, which has then become postmodernism. These ideas are that – we are just a subset of evolutionary process and we are the way we are and we cannot control the way that we are. 
And, and this is very important for cults, totalitarian states to establish that you are not an individual. You are just part of a group. And if they can establish that and they can do away with true guilt and innocence, then they can essentially say, well, you are guilty because of the way that you're brought up. You have a parasite in your mind, which people have said, have literally said, all white people have incurable parasites. They said this about the Jews. They said this, people have said this about black people, right? We People have said this about all sorts of race, people of race, different creeds, different sects. And when you can move it away from an individual to a group, you can say that group is quote unquote guilty, not because of anything that they have done, but just because of who they are or the group that they've been associated with. And so this is an, an important idea that is finds itself in critical race theory, which is set up against free will because it's essentially saying you as an individual do not have free will. You don't have the freedom to think and choose who you are. It has all been socially determined. And if that is the case and you are then found within the quote unquote guilty group, even though you as an individual has not done anything, then the only logical conclusion is to send you to a re-education camp, to send you to a gulag, to send you to a place where you are re-educated until you know better, until you come out of your colonialized um, interior, inter internal um, oppression, because you don't even know it. You need to become free of these shackles in your mind. And if you can't conform, well, now you have an incurable disease that wasn't even your fault because remember, it was socially constructed. You can't control it. Well, what do we do with all these millions of people who have parasites in their minds that are incurable because of the way that they were raised? Well, we can look at history and see what people have done. We can look at history and see the millions of people that were sent to gas chambers in Nazi Germany, millions of Jews. We can look in, in, in Russia, the USSR, Millions of people, we can look in Cambodia, the, the millions of people that were sent to the killing fields because of their group. We can look throughout history and we see it happening even today. These are very, very important ideas to understand and to guard against because if once we buy into them in a little bit, in just a, a sliver, if we're buying into this, it is a slippery slope because what they're trying to promise is in, in these cults, and we're going to be talking about this over the next coming weeks of, of these, these what happens in cults. And what they try to do is they promise you redemption, but there, it is a never ending process to find your redemption. And if you can't get there, it's because you didn't believe enough and you asked too many questions. And these are the tactics of totalitarian states and cults. Let's continue. Um, and it goes along with the totalitarian idea. Mm. And Arendt said that the problem is that if you view human society as this river that's flowing, how do you get everybody to flow? I mean, people don't like to flow. People want to keep their traditions. They mm -hmm. want to, you know, they want to have their lives. And she said, what totalitarians do is a, is a few things. The first thing they do is they isolate people. They make people separate. From isolate. People. Right. Isolation makes it difficult. You, you, you can't meet with other people. You can't talk with other people. She said, then they paralyze people. By paralyzed, she means they keep people from taking any spontaneous action themselves, and they do it with constant terror. She mm. said that terror is, in a totalitarian state, what law is in a democracy or, um, or, 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 or a theocracy terror is is what freezes people so they can be put in the stream and moved at will mm. and uh she said that the terror the, the nature of the terror is that it cannot be predictable she said totalitarian terror is different from any other kind of terror that is for example if you live in just an ordinary dictatorship you got some dictator he's not a totalitarian he's just a strong man yeah you kind of know that if you don't cross the strong man you're okay, all right? If, 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 if you don't give this guy trouble, 
he doesn't give you trouble. Um, you know, if you live in a theocracy, if you follow the rules, you'll be okay. Said, so, however, if you live in a totalitarian state, you're never okay. That is, you can be Stalin's closest comrade, and you still get put on trial in the show trials. This is this is really key, and we can see this happening right now across the globe in so many different arenas where it's it's no longer we know what we can say and can't say but anything can be interpreted and twisted and and all of a sudden one day you know become a a a, a taboo thing to say and and we can see this you know eating of your own and you know the social justice warrior movement where it's you have to become more and more and more extreme, radical, and visceral. And if there is one misstep, if you have one misstep outside of that party line, which is you're in a place of anxiety because you don't exactly know where it is, you will get turned on. And one of the reasons that this happens is, as he mentioned, there is this isolation. They're trying to isolate you from especially your family unit and create discord and and cut you off from your stable and safe relationships. And then they breed this culture of like, well, we need to call each other out. You need to report your neighbor, report your friend, report your family member. All right? This is classic communist textbook 101. I've been to North Korea and that's what they do. Everyone is watching everyone and you're going to get reported and there is no longer any safe place. And so you're paralyzed with fear because you don't know, mm, if I say this, is that going to be taken the wrong way? Even if I if I don't mean, if I say a word right now, you see it in, in culture, anything with the word black on it. You know, if you, you have, it's like, it, it's to these extremes where they're, they're digging up people's past from 10 years ago, digging up their own. People on their own side, they're digging up the past from 10 years ago on Twitter, silly things. And they're just totally ruining and destroying people's lives. Why would someone do that? It's to create and instill this paralyzing fear that I don't want to say anything because if I do, I might lose my job. If I do, I might get attacked by the mob. And the the problem is that it's those same very people who are attacking are attacking because if they don't attack, they're comrades are going to attack them because they're not screaming loud enough. They're not fighting loud enough. They're not, you know, trying to be, you know, woke enough. They're not realizing they're privileged enough. And so what happens then is the mob begins to eat their own. And it is a very, very dangerous road to be on. So the, the solution to this is we cannot fall prey to fear and we cannot fall prey to the, the isolating tactics. We have to stay within it, within community. We have to stay with, within a, a group of people within our family unit and listening to other voices, not just isolating into one camp. And then at the same time, we can't fall prey to fear. We can't be afraid of saying something. And if we have fear of saying something, we probably should say it. We probably should say it. Let's continue. And that's what happened. Be, and that's definitely what happened. Precisely. In fact, it was often the people closest who ended up in the gulags or getting a bulletin back in the head. And, and she said there was a reason for that. The reason is that the, the only way that terror accomplishes its, its goals in a totalitarian state is if it is completely unpredictable and people know it. Because if you can predict it, you can take action on your own. And the whole point of the totalitarian state is that you must never take action on your own. Mm. You are livestock. And that's the totalitarian notion, is that you are cattle to be herded. You are, you, and, and this is where she said, and I quote from her, in totalitarian systems, guilt and innocence are senseless notions. They have no meaning. And what she meant was that totalitarians deny free will. Because if you have no free will, you're never guilty. Because you, you didn't choose anything. But you're never innocent either. You're just cattle. She said, if you start in a totalitarian, if a totalitarian system says, oh, th uh, this guy's guilty of breaking this law, 
that messes up the system because then people know what law to follow. But so she pointed out that in the show trials, there weren't really trials about guilt or innocence. Everybody knew in the very beginning what was going on. Mm -hmm. This guy was going to get shot. The show trial was to terrorize people. It was to make people say, hey, that could be me tomorrow. And I didn't do anything wrong, but neither did he. Nobody even knew what they did. They just ended up with a knock on the door and boom, they're on trial and, 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 and they're shot. And guys, girls, we are seeing this today. We're seeing this on the Twitter mobs. We're seeing this on the, the Facebook mobs where people, because they, for no apparent reason, because of the color of their skin, the position that they hold, something that they said, they're all of a sudden being viscerally attacked, doxxed, um, shadow banned, um, kicked off platforms for saying things like a man is not a woman, for saying things like men cannot give birth, for having an opinion that people are getting viscerally attacked and having their lives destroyed. I mean, people's, you know, family members are having their lives destroyed because of what a different individual has done. And so notice, I want you to notice the, the totalitarian cult-like tactics that are being used right now in some of these, these quote-unquote revolutionary um, movements today that are wrapped up in words of justice, of love, and equality. But what they are pushing for is none of those things. Let's continue. Oh, the denial of free will is the essence of totalitarian management of populations. Totalitarians look at you like cattle. Their goal is to herd you. Uh, a, a communist will herd you towards dictatorship of the proletariat. A Nazi will herd you towards rule of the Aryans. They all have got their, their, their movement and you're just a cog in that movement, and cogs can never have free will. Mm. So the denial of free will is the cornerstone of a totalitarian society, and, and it's extraordinarily to, dangerous. To interject, um, you know, Marxism also essentially says that there is no such thing as the individual. You are just a, a sub substructure cog, if you right. will, of the greater right. social structure. So. Um, you are not an individual, you are a individual. You are just part of whatever identity politic group that they happen to slice you in today. Um, and, and to your point about the proletariat and those closest to, to Stalin um, essentially getting a bullet in the back of their head, it was, well, the, the pie was sliced a little differently today and you are now um, you know, a person of, of privilege who's, you know, oppressing and we're going to just reshuffle the deck. Um, but th there seems to be that you're making an argument that the, the basis of individuality, the basis that I am an individual that is capable of my own agency, of my own thought that is different than any, any of my, my race, my, my gender, my my age or 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 uh what's the fourth one my class it, it i am able to think independently you're saying that 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 notion of free will is tied inexorably to the notion of an individual and the moment that we undermine the idea of free will the individual no longer exists and it, it is just a, a setup for a totalitarian, um, terrorizing state. Yes, exactly. Uh, and the one thing a totalitarian state cannot tolerate is even a single individual who asserts independent thought and free will. That's lethal to a totalitarian state. The, there, there, there was an, an, an example of this um, is uh, Václav Havel who is a, 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 a Czech uh, playwright and philosopher who, after the fall of communism, actually became president of the Czech Re of Re of Republic. He um, was involved in the resistance to the communist state there. And he wrote a, um, a very famous essay that was passed secretly among the resistance people to the communist state um, about a greengrocer 
Uh, and um, it, it's a fascinating essay. And what Havel said is, imagine <clears throat> in this communist country that we live in, if you have a guy who's a greengrocer, he has this little shop and he sells vegetables, and the government requires that you put up communist slogans on posters on the wall of your shop. Everybody does that. You have to do it. He says, what would happen if one morning the green grocer gets up and just says, I'm not playing along with this anymore. And he takes a poster stand. That's all. He doesn't, you know, riot. He doesn't go out and vocally oppose the government. He just kind of gets a mind of his own and says, I just don't like these posters in my shop. That's the dangerous thing, having a mind of your own. I want you to remember this little section of the conversation because after we, we finish with this clip in a few minutes, we're going to go back to this idea that not a single person, the most dangerous thing in these in cults or in totalitarian states is not a single person can have a thought or an idea outside of the talking points of the party. Let's continue. He said that that action is the greatest possible threat to that to, to that totalitarian state. It's more of a threat than an army of tanks. They can never let people think for themselves. So he said that what we have to do as a resistance to this is become the greengrocers. Mm. We have to stop paying homage to this stuff. We have to stop putting up the posters. You can do it quietly. You can do it subtly. But we have to stop being a part of this. And that will destroy the system. And it worked. But people in the communist countries stopped playing along. Really? So, my, I mean, my, my initial thought is that I understand fully why that act is the most dangerous act. Um, it's, it's essentially showing that they they are thinking for themselves and thought is dangerous. It is so dangerous. And that simple act would have instantly led them to the gulag. Like that simple act would have yes, instantly. Yes. Yes. That's, yes. That's your death yes. penalty. Right. Um, yes, absolutely. But if a million people did it, they couldn't stop it. That's the problem. That, and that's why they take you to the gulag, to make sure a million people didn't do it. And uh, Vaslav Havel said, look, let everybody do it at the same time. Not a riot. Not we we don't show up at the at the at the Capitol with with the AK forty seven. We just take down the posters quietly without saying a word. And you see, actually, this in real life. Um, there's a guy named Nikolai Ceausescu. Before we get into this amazing story, I want to point out that the the most powerful thing that you can do as an individual is not to fight. It's not to riot, but it's as to live as an individual with free thought and free will. It's to say, okay, I, you know, whether, whether it's your family structure, whether it's your workplace, whether it's the school that you're in or the place that you live, the most powerful act that you can have and the most, most impactful thing on the people around you, it's not shouting violent chants rioting, burning down the city and, and, and storming the government with guns. No, don't do that. The most impactful thing is for you to, as an individual, stand up and be like, wait, I, I have power. I have agency. I can think. I can read. I can study. I can come up with, uh, with a thoughts and opinions of my own. I can search out and find truth. There is truth. There is meaning. Words have meaning. That is the most powerful thing. That is going to have an impact on the people around you. That is how we own the future. By, by thinking for ourselves, by studying and searching out truth, and then in a humble, respectful way, taking down the, the posters, if you will, and say, no, this is, this is what I believe. This is how I'm, I'm going to live as, as a person with free will. Let's continue with this powerful story from, from Romania. He was the uh, communist dictator of Romania. And uh, he was a brutal guy, a really nasty guy, a real Stalinist. And he ruled with an iron fist for decades. And when communism began to fall, and this, this was in, in the late, I think it was in the late 80s, um, 
people started kind of doing what Hot what Boss of Hobel had said. And they kind of they, they weren't playing along anymore. So Ceausescu um, saw this happening and was panicked by it because it was millions of people start, starting to not listen. Mm. So he had a rally in the capital city in Romania where he got up on a balcony to this crowd and he called the people in the capital city. There, there were at least hundreds of thousands of people in the crowd. And he began talking to them about marxist leninist ideology. And they began to laugh. The crowd laughed. Mm. And you could see his face. It's actually on on, uh, on uh, YouTube. Really? He went, he went white. He went pale. He realized, this is it. When they laugh at me, this is it. And he was dead a day later in the shop. So the... What, ha what, what Havel was basically saying is that when we assert our human dignity, when we exert our free will, when we say we're not a part of this system anymore, when you're in a, a, a totalitarian state, that is what kills totalitarianism. That's why they need to terrorize people, because that's if they let that happen, they're done. That That is just such a a powerful story it's th there's there's a quote by i believe by anna ardent as well she says the greatest enemy of authority therefore is contempt and the surest way to undermine that authority is laughter it's through this this laughter of be like oh i can't believe that you still think that i'm gonna fall for that one okay and that is one of the most powerful most powerful things, and, and, and we see it exemplified right here in, in that last story from Dr. Egnor. But he mentions earlier that the most dangerous thing is a single individual standing up with free will, standing up and saying, wait a minute, um, one plus one doesn't equal three, one plus one equals two. That's the most dangerous thing. I mean, I've recently saw I recently saw a lady arguing that math is racist, that, that, that the structure of, of math in the education system is inherently racist. Where, where do we go when we don't have, when words don't have meaning, when numbers don't have meaning, when we're de trying to deconstruct all of the systems in our world, deconstruct truth in this, in, in create this postmodern dystopia? Where does it lead us? Not to good places. But the, the, there was a study to exemplify this point of how it plays out in, in actual social psychology in the world. There's this study by Solomon Ash back in the 1950s. He was a social psychologist and he did this really simple experiment. He had a, had a group of people in a room and everyone was in on it except for one person. And they showed them three different lines and they said, you know, which uh, three lines and then a single line um, over on the other side. And they said, is, you know, A bigger than the this test line? And first, everyone in the group would give the correct answers of, you know, lines, you know, line A is clearly longer than line B. And so they do a couple test ones to make the, the, the person feel at home. And then all of a sudden, the, the group would change and they'd start, the entire group would say, you know, if line B is clearly long, longer than line A, they'd say, mm, no, line A is longer. And the whole group would agree, yep, line A is definitely longer. And they found out that the majority of the people, when there's a whole group of people saying line A is longer, even though it clearly wasn't, the participant in the study would go along with the group, go along with the peer pressure and be like, yeah, line A is longer. And they did this time and time and time again. And actually within 35, the 35 participants that they used, only one out of the 35 always gave correct answers. The rest of them, the majority of them would go along with the crowd. But the most important thing in this study that really exemplifies what Dr. Ignore is saying is that when they did the test and they had one person of the group that was actually in on it give the correct answer, the likelihood 
that the, the, the test subject would actually give the right answer and not go with the crowd skyrocketed. The moment that one person said, nope, this is truth. This is the answer. This is morality. A is longer than B. One plus one equals two. One plus one does not equal three. The moment that one person said the logical, rational thing that everyone can see in front of their eyes, the emperor has no clothes. The emperor has no clothes. The moment that one person did it, the illusion broke off their minds and they sided with truth. They sided with what they could clearly see. And that is why, even from studies that we can see in psychology, why these totalitarian states use um gaslighting where they're 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 kind and they're evil to you at the same like at the same time they're isolating you from all your safe relationships they're breaking down the family unit they're 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 making their members exert themselves and and chant and, and going to extreme conditions and places to essentially brainwash tie up and and sow seeds of fear and terror into their hearts. And t- tomorrow, the next episode, we're going to actually be going through some traits of totalitarian cults. What? And so it's not just totalitarian states, but totalitarian organizations or groups or ways of thinking. And we're going to break down and we're going to see what are some of those common traits across all cults, across all totalitarian ideologies and groups. And then further on to the series, we're going to be looking at how these things have actually been played out in history with with the French Revolution, with Yugoslavia, with with Venezuela. And we're going to gain a picture and gain an understanding of how these totalitarian states and cults work, why they operate. And often, I mean, different cults have different end goals, but their ultimate end goals of all totalitarian states and cults is control. They want control. And the difference between authoritarianism and totalitarianism, authoritarianism says, here's the rules, follow the rules. If you don't, you'll get in trouble. Totalitarianism says, you cannot have a thought outside of what I give you. You cannot have connections outside of the relationships that I say are okay. It's a total control of the individual from their their thoughts, their emotions, their entire world, where authoritarianism says, here are the laws, obey the laws, or you'll get in trouble. Totalitarianism says, we are going to sow fear into your life to control every single aspect so you can't leave. And if you do leave, you will be sorry that you did. That is all for this episode with Dr. Well, it's with myself going through Dr. Egnor's little clip there. I've really enjoyed kind of breaking down some of these thoughts with you. And I'm really excited for going forward into this series, talking about some of these historical incidences, um, instances, and uh, just tactics of totalitarian cults. So really excited. Also, I'm really excited about my book, Anchored, The Discipline to Stop Drifting. I wrote this book when when we first moved here to the Middle East and everything in my life was just falling apart. I had these metric systems of what I thought success looked like. And uh, it turned out that a lot of them were just bogus. And so I started writing this book um, a number of years ago. And I, I look back, you know, it's a short book, 100 page read, really actionable. And I look back onto this book and and the things that I think about the way that I frame and structure my life often comes from this. So if you feel stuck, if you feel like you're drifting from thing to thing that you can't get your footing, you can't figure out how to really sink your teeth into your dream and get to where you want to get, then I highly, highly recommend my book, Anchored, The Discipline to Stop Drifting. The link is in the show notes. Uh, Finally, 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 you are a change maker. I'm Lucas Scrobot. And so I hope this week you decide to go out and pursue truth. I love to get your questions. So WhatsApp me at plus one, two, zero, two, nine, two, two, zero, two, two, zero. And I will answer every text, every question. If you ask, ask a question there, I will answer it here on the show. 
I hope that you go out and own your future this week.